today's topic is it's a great topic. Uh, I, I want to, and we've got a perfect speaker to talk about it. It's uh, the fight for China's future civil society versus the Chinese Communist Party. You know, having uh, having covered China as a correspondent for the Washington Post, I was there to see kind of the the growth of civil society, which is kind of a fairly new concept in China, um, in a country where basically the government and the party uh, control everything. The idea of non-government organizations is a relatively new and uncertain concept. Although where I come from in the United States, it's a uh, it's something that we've used to ever ever since the U.S. Civil War, when you first started started having volunteer organizations coming out to help wounded soldiers. So this is one of our, our, our occasional series of talks by scholars and authors from the Journalism and Media Studies Center. I should introduce myself. I'm Keith Richberg. I'm the director of the center. We're under the Faculty of Social Sciences. But more importantly now, I want to introduce our speaker. Uh, Willie Wolock Lam is one of these people who I could say that I actually knew him before I met him. Because when I was a correspondent in Beijing, pretty much anyone who was writing about China from Beijing had to call Willie Lam on the phone to find out what was going on inside of China. Uh, he's been described as one of the quintessential China watchers. Uh, and uh, uh, to make us envious uh, in the journalism side, he was one of the people who managed to straddle journalism and academia. He started out as a journalist. He was with the South China Morning Post. Uh, he was the China correspondent up through the uh, June 1989 events. And then he was the China editor of South China Morning Post through the 1997 handover. Uh, right now, he's a professor at the Center for China Studies at the uh, Chinese University here in Hong Kong, and he's also a fellow with the Jamestown Foundation in uh, Washington, D.C. And so without further ado, uh, yeah. and Willie Lam, and he'll take some questions after your talk, right? So Willie sure. could read the stay on and take some questions. So without further ado, please welcome Willie Lam. Well, thank you, Keith. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a big pleasure to be, for me to be back to my alma mater, even though I left some, uh, well, several decades earlier. <laughs> so lots of nostalgia uh, mixed with uh, uh, prognosis about the future. Well, uh, thanks very much, Keith, for a very generous um, introduction. And um, the, the theme tonight is the fight for China's future, uh, the civil society versus uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Well, I was very, um, I, I was very elated that so many people have come to tonight. So it shows me that uh, there are indeed many believers, not just in the civil society in Hong Kong, which has been responsible for the past uh, protests for the, for the past five months, but also the civil society in China. Um, first of all, I would like to congratulate the organizers for picking the right time, because uh, the Chinese Communist Party just held its fourth plenary session last week. Uh, before that, people had trouble uh, predicting the dates of the Congress. Uh, of, of the uh, plenary session of the Party Congress because Xi Jinping had been de delaying it for almost one year. Uh, why he had to delay it? Well, we suspect uh, he faces some difficulties within the Central Committee, things which we'll discuss later on. Uh, those difficulties include uh, the Chinese economy going through rough patches, which are troubles with negotiations with Donald Trump, and of course the Hong Kong issue. But most of all, uh, I think uh, even though the theme of this fourth plenary session is to modernize the state governance system and to improve uh, state governance capability, uh, Xi Jinping so far lacks the magic bullet, bullet to pull it through. But returning to my talk uh, this evening, uh, I have to mention uh, that unfortunately, even though the full text of the uh, fourth plenary session of the Central Committee came out last night, there was no mention of any uh, role to be played by the civil society. In fact, uh, Xi Jinping, who is the what we call the lifelong core of the Communist Party, because he is not only 
President, General Secretary, Commander in Chief, uh, lifelong call, and so forth. And uh, of course, uh, most of my friends in Beijing say that uh, he would at least serve until the 22nd Party Congress in 2032, uh, when he will be uh, when he will have reached the grand old age of 79. Uh, 79, of course, um, the perspective in Beijing and Hong Kong and the West uh, is different. For people in Beijing, if you, have, if you are in your late 70s, you have barely uh, crossed over the threshold of middle age. So uh, 79 uh, is not that old an age. And uh, Xi Jinping, uh, to all intents and purposes, despite some health issues, uh, he is still going strong. So, um, the theme of the Party Congress is precisely stern party leadership. That means more power to the party, and uh, by extension, more power to the call of the leadership. So, uh, Xi Jinping made it doubly clear that whether it is the east, south, west, or north, whether it concerns affairs of the party, the state, the military, mass organizations, as well as uh, academia, the party is in charge. Uh, I, ha I have to show you, I have to demonstrate the fact that by mass organizations, it, it doesn't mean um, NGOs or uh, elements of the civil society. As far as I know, and as, as far as the latest statistics uh, show, there are now close to 700,000 social organizations uh, in China, because the Chinese prefer to use the word social organization instead of NGOs. Most of these 700,000 uh, social organizations are actually government-organized NGOs, okay, government organized NGOs or, or gongos, which are a contradiction in terms. Uh, but more important are the three to four million unregistered uh, civil society organizations. Uh, we also need to take into consideration the fact that uh, the civil society includes the members of the underground church, and by most estimates, um, Christians, Catholics, Muslims, and so forth. Within 10 years, they would outnumber the 70 million uh, members who make up the Communist Party. So uh, I will here go over briefly the so-called police state apparatus, which uh, President Xi, uh, together with uh, cutting edge technology in um, artificial intelligence, uh, in mass data, cloud computing, and so forth, uh, have uh, constructed, and it has been very effective in um, ensuring that most sectors of the civil society, including dissident groups, human rights, lawyers, labor NGOs, underground house churches, and so forth, are kept under 24-hour surveillance. And uh, that is widespread invasion of civil rights of ordinary citizens, including the uh, collection of DNA samples. Uh, well, initially, we thought that the collection of DNA samples, DNA samples would only take, be taking place in uh, Xinjiang. But now, we know that this is done all over China, all over China. For what purpose, we can discuss later. Uh, the budget for maintaining stability, the so-called Weiwen budget, Stability maintenance budget uh, for 2019 is a gargantuan 1.39 trillion RMB. Well, uh, this is a, an astronomical figure, uh, particularly when we compare this to the fact that the official PLA budget for this year uh, is only 1.19 trillion RMB. So the money spent by the party state operators in maintaining stability actually trumps the PLA budget. Of course, there are PLA experts who think that the publicized budget of 1.19 trillion yuan is only about half of the real budget spent by the PLA. But nonetheless, the 1.39 trillion 
stability maintenance budget is a huge sum. It's a huge sum indeed. However, despite the fact that uh, Xi Jinping, uh, when the economy is not doing so well, is devoting so much money to maintaining stability, we see no uh, downward trend in the number of mass incidents, which is Chinese speak for disturbances, uh, demonstrations, um, strikes, and so forth. The latest figures show that there are at least 120 such mass incidents in China uh, every year. And apart from uh, AI-assisted uh, maintenance system, the Chinese are also depending on human intelligence. Okay, So uh, we have this interesting figure that so-called volunteer vigilantes. That means, in fact, spies uh, on the payroll of uh, different districts in Beijing, Shanghai, and, and other cities. In the uh, bustling Chaoyang district uh, in Beijing, uh, the number of spies, uh, part-time spies, actually number 130,000, or 277 spies per square kilometers. Well, this certainly breaks the world record, right? Well, uh, well, you may ask the question, what do these people spy on? Uh, we can discuss this in the Q&A period, except to say that, well, if they see any suspicious figures, including possibly um, very inquisitive academics uh, from different parts of the world, they might want to uh, report this case to the uh, local police station, particularly if uh, these inquisitive academics from the West are staying with a local family. Well, uh, Xi Jinping, who has a uh, doctor of laws from uh, Tsinghua University, uh, has been very big on the rule of law as a way to modernize what he calls the state governance system. However, he is at heart a fervent believer in Han Fei, the, this uh, prehistoric uh, master of the logistics schools. And Han Fei's uh, major belief is that the emperor must use so-called yan xing jun fa, stern laws and harsh punishments to control the state, okay, to control the state. And even though Xi Jinping has said that the party must act within the parameters of the constitution and the law, yet the party still plays a pivotal role in leading the job of writing the constitution and the laws and enforcing them. In fact, uh, the country's prosecutors, police, and uh, judges have sworn their unquestioned loyalty to party leadership. So uh, despite the apparent uh, pursuit of rule by law or rule of law, as is understood in China, in fact, the police, the prosecutors, and the courts, they all report to the party committees in their respective arenas. and they. Re Ultimately, they report to Xi Jinping. So, these are the wives of the disappeared human rights lawyers. Well, uh, human rights lawyers are a particularly uh, important sector of the civil society who deserves extra support because in the early days, in the 2000s and in the past decade, uh, we see Hu Jintao, for example, who displayed more tolerance for uh, the civil service. These human rights lawyers actually played a very important role in mediating between members of the disadvantaged classes on the one hand and a uh, administration which is not very good in responding to the demands of the public. 
So uh, in the 2000s, actually, many human rights lawyers received official awards precisely for diffusing public tension because they acted as in go-betweens. Go-betweens. Uh, on the one hand, the demands of the disadvantaged classes who have been who have not been denied the uh, rule of law, uh, proper treatment in the courts and so forth, uh, together with an administration which is determined to stamp out challenges to its legal system. However, in the past 10 years, we have seen, unfortunately, several dozens of these human rights lawyers having been incarcerated. Many of them have been disappeared for two or three years. But the most important thing to note from the point of view of civil society is that despite this 24-hour surveillance, despite the fact that many of the human rights lawyers are in jail, they have maintained a nationwide organization. Okay, They have maintained a nationwide network so that uh, when abuses occur, such as the mass arrests of 200-something uh, uh, human rights attorneys in 2015, in July 2015 took place, they were able to issue statements and they were able to uh, have follow-up actions uh, to help the disadvantaged sectors. Okay, well, here we come to the uh, theoretical underpinning of Xi Jinping's so-called police state apparatus. Well, in the Chinese context, you have a theory to explain everything, okay? And for Xi Jinping, it is the theory of the ideological battleground, okay? It is very simple. Uh, for Xi Jinping, the universe of discourse, that means everything under the sun in China is a battleground, okay? And uh, Xi Jinping's aim is to fill up the battleground with politically correct ideas. The battleground, meaning the internet, meaning the uh, uh, writing uh, circles, meaning the books published in universities, but also meaning the lectures being given by professors in universities, well, this battleground must be monopolized by professors, by commissars, by ideological workers who subscribe to uh, Xi Jinping's theory. So he said, if we do not fill the battleground with correct ideas, it will be infiltrated by unorthodox, westernized precepts. He also said that if we do not occupy the Jandi, the battleground, others will do so. Well, uh, the goal of the police state apparatus is precisely to deny the battleground to non-party affiliated elements, especially the civil society. And as long as the civil society can preserve its organization and its voice in the battleground, uh, the fight for China's so remains a toss-up. There is still a possibility that if the party runs into difficulties, which I'll elaborate later on, there will be a large body of civil society advocates who might be willing to not only organize, but to air their views, views which are different from the politically correct ones. OK. I'll give you a few examples of the fact that uh, in spite of Xi Jinping's apparent ability to monopolize the battleground, there are powerful members within the Communist Party, Okay, beginning with, uh, to the left, uh, the, the late Hu Yabang, uh, the general party secretary who was ousted in January 87 and whose death on um, April 15th led to the June 4th crisis, and his son uh, to the right, uh, Hu Jiaping. Well, these followers of Deng Xiaoping's reform and open door policy have reiterated that one of the reasons why Xi Jinping is difficulty is having uh, 
facing immense difficulties, growing the economy, uh, ensuring GDP growth rate of at least 6%, and also handling the trade war with uh, Donald Trump is precisely because they have given up Deng Xiaoping's reform and open door policy. And that Xi Jinping has been reinstating uh, Maui's values with gusto, okay? Uh, I'll give you a few more examples. Uh, well, these are very courageous uh, academics uh, teaching in universities or researching uh, back home. So we have a uh, university renowned law professor Xu Jiang Run from Tsinghua University. He said uh, late last year, while reform has gone on for 40 years, we are back overnight to the ancient regime. So he said, he added, in light of China's experience of using the open door policy to bring about domestic reform, he urged Beijing not to endanger ties with the Western world led by the US, but to continue to adopt universal norms. Uh, well, the background to this is that uh, Professor Xi has been given uh, severe warnings and uh, he's under 24 hour surveillance. So the fact that he was able to get out this message on the internet speaks a lot about the uh, flexibility, the viability of the civil society. Next, um, I would like to quote from uh, Ms. G uh, at the middle at the middle section, uh, Ji Zhongyun. Well, Ms. Ji is an in, uh, international relations expert, but she, in her younger days, she was Mao Zedong's uh, English language translator. So Ji Zhongyun said, China should open up wider to the things American. If American style hospitals flourished in China, China's blood sucking medical model would be banished. She wrote, if American-style education took root in China, Chinese students need not go abroad to enjoy advanced pedagogical concepts. So uh, these are fervent believers in Deng Xiaoping's reform and open door policy, and they have now openly laid into Xi Jinping's apparent scheme to reinstate Maoism. So Ms. Qi, Professor Qi, added that most of China's economic woes could be attributed to monopolization of resources by the privileged classes, and that is why Chinese government would never accept America's terms. Okay, so we see that within the uh, sector of the civil society consisting of professors, uh, leading intellectual lights, uh, leading opinion makers, uh, they are not afraid to openly contradict many of Xi Jinping's most ingrained beliefs, including the fact that uh, the Xi leadership is reviving uh, Mao Zedong's, many of Mao Zedong's beliefs um, with a lot of conviction. Well, here we see the, uh, an another heartbreaking aspect of the uh, state's fight against the civil society, the fact that between 2016, 2014 and 2016, there was large-scale demolition of churches, including crosses of more than 2,000 uh, religious establishments in Zhejiang province. Well, Zhejiang, of course, uh, it was no accident. Zhejiang was where Xi Jinping was the number one party secretary from 2002 to, two, from, uh, 2002 to 2007. And I would say that the uh, well-organized destruction of the symbols of worship and also the installation of, uh, you see at the top right-hand corner, uh, CCTV cameras in, in all the churches, both uh, above rung and uh, within the house churches, uh, demonstrate that at least apparently uh, the police state apparatus has a stranglehold over the activities of even underground churches. But as, as I will show later, the different uh, 
churches from different denominations, uh, Christians, Catholics, they have been able to, to preserve their strength because they have been able to maintain the provincial, cross-provincial, and nationwide networks, okay? Uh, through the internet, despite the tight censorship on IT, they have been able to preserve the networks. And uh, every Sunday, they uh, they are still able to hold some kind of uh, congregations, even though not the conventional congregations as we are accustomed to in the West. Okay. Next, we come to the change in the armor of the police state. That means despite so much money spent, we see that uh, there are changes in the armor. So at a time when the economy is going through rough patches, the political legal apparatus is depending on hefty outlay. For example, paying off inf informants to those the frames of discontent. However, Despite what Xi Jinping calls the modernization of state governance, problems such as the grievances of the underclasses have not been addressed. In fact, uh, you might be surprised to learn that uh, Xi Jinping came up with uh, the category called the, the Xin Hei Wu Lei, the new five black categories, the new five black categories which would threaten uh, state stability. And one of the Xin Hei Wu Lei, the new five uh, black categories, is the disadvantaged classes. So it shows that the uh, Xi regime uh, does not see as its task narrowing the gap between rich and poor and tending to the grievances of the underclasses. Uh, I mentioned the fact that uh, this task of mediating between the underclasses and the state used to be performed very well by the human rights lawyers. But now, most of the human rights lawyers uh, are <clears throat> behind bars, even though they have <clears throat> been able to maintain uh, their, their organizations. And despite the call made at the fourth plenary session last week for modernization of state governance system, we see that the government's problem-solving skills remain highly in doubt. This is illustrated by the profusion of cases of social injustice. Well, I think most of us have heard of Mao Zedong's most famous slogan, uh, power grows out of the barrel of a gun, right? So you, you would have thought that just for the sake of regime stability, uh, the Xi leadership would be paying a lot of attention to uh, ensuring that soldiers get well paid and demobilize soldiers, including uh, young uh, college graduates who uh, spend a few years uh, in the PLA just to burnish the uh, CV, uh, that they would be it would be easy for them to find uh, new jobs. However, the picture is different. Uh, for seven, eight years in a row, demobilized and unemployed soldiers have increased in numbers. Uh, and they have, again, built up cross-provincial wide organizations over more than a dozen provinces. So every summer, every summer, as a, almost as a ritual, these uh, demobilized soldiers, old and young, would converge upon Beijing. Uh, two years ago, they even held a demonstration consisting of more than 25,000 demobilized soldiers right outside the headquarters of the uh, PLA uh, headquarters. So it shows that Xi Jinping, despite his commitment to modernization of uh, state institutions and systems, have been dealing have not been dealing with this uh, social issues uh, with, with any kind of effectiveness. The same is true for 
the victims of the so-called P2P wealth creation products, which are little more than Ponzi schemes, where you pay the uh, scheme leaders, you, you buy the health creation projects, but getting really nothing in return. Well, the fact that these Ponzi schemes have been flourishing for the past six, seven years is largely because of corruption, okay? Largely because of corruption. And because these victims have not been able to recover their money, they have been holding demonstrations year after year. So we see, uh, this is a picture of the demobilized soldiers, uh, some of them wearing uh, uh, their insignia and um, meritorious buttons and so forth, holding demonstrations in Beijing. And these are the victims of the P2P Ponzi scheme like uh, wealth creation products holding demonstrations in the heart of Beijing, in the finance street in Beijing. So time and again, we see this happening. We also have examples of um, fake dairy products and vaccines. Okay, fake dairy products and vaccines, which have flooded the Chinese market for the past five, six years. Again, because presumably of corruption and uh, dereliction of duty, we see no end of this uh, uh, big shame on a, a society which is at least getting richer. Okay, so instead we have seen uh, the parents of the consumers of the vaccines, the parents of the consumers of the fake dairy products, organizing themselves, again, organizing themselves on a provincial or cross-provincial basis. So whenever there's an opportunity, they would um, show their presence and uh, they would place a, a big demand on the state administration to make uh, some remedial actions. But so far, uh, the Xi Jinping administration has not been uh, very reactive to these um, efforts to promote social harmony. Apart from preserving the strength, that means maintaining nationwide organizations, there are ways and means in which the civil society has been fighting back, okay? So I cite two examples. One is fostering an organized state of this organization. Well, this um, is quite a mouthful. <laughs> uh, according to uh, a respected economist, former Peking University professor Sha Yelang, it is difficult for intellectuals or NGO activists to organize any party activities owing to the police state apparatus. Yet, through the media and through different kinds of real life interactions and appeals to people's conscience, a large group of civil society activists and politicized citizens aware of the importance of civil rights could be formed to clamor for action when opportunities arise. Well, one example was the uh, untimely death and burial of the uh, Nobel Peace Laureate Liu Xiaobo. Okay, so despite the 24-hour surveillance which the police state apparatus has slapped on the friends of Liu Xiaobo, we see uh, former associates of the Nobel Laureate from more than 10 provinces being able to, to converge on uh, Liaoning, where the burial took place, okay? And also, all over the uh, internet, we see commemorative articles, uh, expressions of appreciation for Liu Xiaobo. Okay, so this, is, this qualifies as a kind of an organized state of this, of this organization. We also see examples of such an organized state of this organization in terms of how the underground churches organize themselves, okay? So I'll give you the example of the Science Church in 
Beijing, which is one of the largest underground congregations in the capital. They have decided to break up its congregation by dividing it into 40 or 50 groups. These groups, according to one member whom I talked to, these groups meet separately away from churches and easy to identify premises, most often in large parks and forests in the suburbs. And they don't necessarily congregate. However, every weekend they meet and through the internet and other uh, civil and, and, and other social media, they have been able to receive messages and sermons from the leaders of the church. Another example of the civil society fighting back is what uh, Toronto sonologist Diana Fu calls intervention via atomized actions. So Professor Fu argues that in an an authoritarian state, civil society participants could take different types of individualized, well-tailored, and sharply focused actions that could avoid head-on coalition with the police. Well, um, at this stage, the contention between the police state and the civil society resembles a little bit like David and Goliath in the Bible story. Okay, so the organizers of most uh, civil society groups do not want unnecessary sacrifices. However, one method proposed by Professor Fu is disguised collective action, okay, disguised collective action, which encourages civil society groups to exercise strategic adaptations via atomized actions of protest. Examples have included the flash demos by the five brave families in uh, Guangdong, okay? Uh, they were able to engage in flash uh, expressions of their views, for example, uh, holding banners in railway stations, advocating uh, women's rights. Uh, we also see examples of the um, We also see examples of the attendance of the performance of the French play Les Misérables uh, in Shanghai last year, when the attendance gathered afterwards out of their own initiative. There was no uh, well, -organized, well, well organization. This was more or less an impromptu action when they sing, when they began to sing. Do you hear the people sing? Okay, do you hear the people sing? Well, we saw similar actions in Hong Kong uh, this year, okay, but uh, this spontaneous display of uh, people power, civil service power, if you will, actually took place earlier in Shanghai in 2018. And one other example I would like to share with you is. Uh, staging quickly organized labor strikes, such as the 2018 Jashak incident in Shanghai. So what happened is that, well, Jashak uh, Technology Company was a medium-sized factory, and uh, the bosses of the factory refused collective bargaining by the staff. So within a few months, or within several weeks, we see the organizers, again, uh, pretty much on an impromptu basis. The organizers of the strikes uh, successfully communicating with a bunch of Marxist scholars in uh, Peking University and Tsinghua University so that these students were able to come to Shenzhen to give support to the Jashak uh, workers just within the space of a week or two. So this immediately made nationwide news, even though, of course, at the end, we know that um, most of the uh, labor organizers and the student organizers were detained by police. Okay, so we come to the intri intriguing question as to whether 
despite the fact that the civil society is undergoing uh, rough patches, whether they might be able to have their voices heard to the extent that they might affect the trajectory of political development in China. Well, no less than Xi Jinping himself. And uh, I think I was one of the earliest to write about his statement uh, made in January this year, January 2019, that uh, the party must raise its guard against a black swan event. Okay, a black swan event. So Xi Jinping said, the party faced seven major risks, including politics, ideology, eco economics, technology, society, the external environment, and party construction. Uh, but what Xi Jinping was referring to was actually a color revolution, okay? A color revolution. I think most of you are familiar with this term because uh, Beijing's definition of what's happening in Hong Kong is precisely a color revolution, which witnesses the collusion between so-called anti-Beijing elements within China on the one hand and uh, the actions of hostile foreign forces on the other. Well, the Black Swan event, or a similar event, uh, ha hasn't yet happened uh, in the mainland, but in Hong Kong, uh, we see many examples of the, the congregation of members of the civil society demanding uh, political reform, de demanding electoral reform. The Black Swan event in Hong Kong has shown up the vulnerability of Xi Jinping's so-called perfect dictatorship. So as a good friend from Tsinghua University, uh, sh sh Professor Xu, Xu Zhengrun, said, well, uh, intellectuals in China must thank Hong Kong's 7 million people for sending the message of freedom to the mainland, okay? It seems improbable at this stage that the Hong Kong virus could have any pivotal impact on the police state in Beijing, but the Black Swan Yvonne has tested the Xi regime to its limits. So, uh, concluding my discussion, I would like to cite the uh, theory of uh, well-known sinologist Ming Xin Pei, okay, Ming Xin Pei, who said in a recent article that evidence from contemporary China and insights from history and social sciences suggest that the possibility of a transition from authoritarianism in China in the not too distant future, perhaps within the next decade and a half, is much greater than many think. Uh, Mr. Pei has identified the following four main symptoms of decay in the Chinese polity. The atrophy of its ideology, the erosion of its performance, particularly in economic development, endemic official corruption, and an intensifying power struggle within the party, okay? Inten uh, uh, intensifying power struggle within the factions in the party regarding the best survival strategy regarding the best survival strategy. Well, at the just ended fourth plenary session of the Central Committee, uh, which was held behind closed doors, we uh, were not given opportunity to see dissension and uh, uh, rivalry amongst the different factions. But it seems true that, as I mentioned, for example, followers of Deng Xiaoping's reform and open door policy, do have differences from followers of Xi Jinping, who seems intent to revive some of Mao Zedong's old uh, norms and institutions. Uh, Min Xinpei also says uh, the, the new Cold War, which seems to have broken out between the US and China, could hasten the CCP's collapse. Well, if not collapse, it's transition to a more uh, people-oriented fashion, okay? The civil society 
could play a very important role, could provide needed help to the CCP faction that favors reform and change. Of course, this is only one way in which the civil society uh, would bring benefit to China. That means providing aid and support to the Communist Party faction, which favors the market, which favors change. The civil society in itself, for example, the underground church, whose, whose members, as I mentioned, uh, are expected to exceed the 90 million party members. They may also play a role in spearheading freedom of religion, freedom of the spirit, freedom of choice, and so forth. But in any case, uh, the Communist Party propaganda is very efficient. Okay, so uh, we in Hong Kong are inevitable consumers of party propaganda. And to the extent that we do not hear too much about the actions of the civil society, which I have summarized. Okay, so uh, get ready for unexpected ways in which civil societies, NGO activists might do their thing and might contribute to the uh, exciting trajectory of political change in China in the coming decade or so. So I'll just end here in this perhaps um, some of you might think is an excessively optimistic note and uh, <laughs> I will take uh, your questions. Uh, for those of you who uh, want to raise queries, could you first identify yourself? Uh, and, and if you have an institution, please identify your institution. Yes, at the back. So good evening, Professor Lam, and I would like to share some views on your question. question. Oh yes, oh, but I will provide some background. You just you just compared. It is unquestionable that Xi Jinping has consolidated consolidated the party power among uh, has consolidated all the political power, unlike his predecessors. And you compared Xi Jinping as a Maoist, whereas those who are protesting in Hong Kong compares the Chinese Communist Party as China, which is much more related to the fascist faction of the political spectrum. So what's your view on Xi Jinping, on his economic process, which cannot be reversed, which cannot be reversed after the reform and opening up, followed by economic liberalization in the 1980s? So what's your view on Xi Jinping? Is he more like a traditional hardcore Maoist, or on the other hand, an ultra-nationalist fascist. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, may I know your uh, name and affiliation? Um, I'm Amphil Tam, uh, a year one student from the Faculty of Social Sciences. Oh, thank you very much. Well, uh, Xi Jinping is a very complicated factor. Uh, but uh, since he is determined to rule until 2032, I think the good news is that we still have uh, plenty of time to uh, observe him. And uh, <laughs> he might yet uh, go through some interesting trajectories. Well, first of all, uh, he's definitely a um, hardcore Marxist. Uh, with a strong streak of, uh, with a strong nationalistic, uh, nationalistic streak, streak. And uh, as you know, uh, after the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991, the Chinese Communist Party, which has no ballot box legitimacy, has only two pillars of support. One is continuous economic growth. The other one is nationalism. Well, the first one, continuous economic growth, is meeting with tremendous challenges. So this year, uh, I can predict that uh, in the last few days of December, they will announce a GDP growth rate for 2019 uh, at 6.1 uh, or 6.2%, okay? 
which they always do. But um, <laughs> most of my uh, economist friends in Beijing think that uh, the real figure seems to be uh, gravitating towards uh, just 3%, half the official rate. So uh, continuous economic growth as a pillar of legitimacy uh, has become risky. Okay, so nationalism becomes very important, and that's why uh, in his interaction with Hong Kong, you can see that both Xi Jinping and his uh, leading comrades in charge of Hong Kong affairs, Han Zheng, the head of the Central Coordination Group on Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office, have been doubling down on law and order. So the, there is one clause in the uh, communique of the fourth plenary session of the Central Committee saying that Hong Kong must improve and modernize its systems to uphold national security. So it means that um, quite likely Article 23 has been put on the agenda and uh, in today's meeting between Han Zheng, who is the Politburo Standing Committee member in charge of Hong Kong, with uh, Mrs. Carrie Lam, uh, Han Zhang also heaped praise on the, not just the Hong Kong administration, but in particular the police. So it means that they will use uh, the police forces, uh, perhaps including uh, the deployment of several hundred police from Guangdong into Hong Kong, of course, once they're in Hong Kong, they start wearing Hong Kong uniform uh, to ensure law and order. And uh, it's also not by accident that the Minister of Public Security, the top cop in China, uh, Mr. Zhao Keqi, uh, has now been made a prominent member of the Central Coordination Group on Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office. And he shows up, Mr. Zhao, the head police, shows up in both Xi Jinping's meeting with uh, Mrs. Lam as well as Han Zheng's meeting with Carrie Lam. So uh, returning to your question about Xi Jinping, um, he has said many nice sounding things at this uh, import expo held in Shanghai just uh, just yesterday. He said it is much better holding hands than uh, not holding hands. It is much better to demolish walls than to build up walls. Uh, this, however, I think represents the force of circumstances because the Chinese economy has been hurt by the um, difficulties with the US. So Xi Jinping might at suitable junctures, present himself as a humble disciple of Deng Xiaoping. But at, it, at its heart of hearts, he is a, he's a Maoist. He's a Maoist, if only because uh, he defines himself as the Mao Zedong of the 21st century, and he believes that a revival of Maoist norms would be most effective in propping up his own power. Uh, remember that Xi Jinping, in power for seven years, already has a lot more power at his disposal than Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, or uh, Hu Jintao. Thank you. Could I have your affiliation? Uh, my name is Harry Xiao. Um, I was a former student, a political science student of this university. Uh, 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 so, Willie, my, there are two questions I want to ask you. Uh, the first question is, uh, you mentioned about progressive pain, uh, you know, the, the uh, symptoms of decay and all that, which is very interesting. So, I would like to uh, uh, get your view on, uh, on uh, this uh, prognosis. Okay, what, do you think, uh, you know, it makes sense uh, uh, the event and all that, from your point of view? 
The second question is more personal. Um, you have been a veteran of uh, China Watch, okay, for many, many years. And uh, so how would you uh, uh, compare your job then with the uh, job now? Is it more difficult or easy for China Watchers these days to do their job? Uh, given you know the information uh, uh, liberali uh, not liberalization but at least the uh, uh, development and, and so on you know there are now more sources and all that. On the other hand, China is uh, is giving a tight lid on uh, on uh, in the news and so on. So uh, so how how would uh, China watchers these days uh, get around these uh, problems and uh, able to do a better or worse job? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, there is a subsect within the uh, business called China Watching, uh, uh, which consists of looking uh, into the future, predicting the trajectory of uh, political and economic change. So apart from Professor uh, Ming Xin Pei, that is, of course, uh, Professor David Shenbao, Professor uh, her Qing Lian and, and so forth. Uh, I believe that, um, well, none of them, of course, are predicting what might change in the near term, that means three, five years. But uh, what they are saying about possible uh, changes in the medium to long term, that means 10, 15 years, um, makes sense. Uh, Part of the reason is, well, you could glean from my presentation, and that is the fact that uh, the Communist Party is finally beginning to uh, examine the adequacy of their institutions and uh, systems of governance. So the, the theme of the just ended fourth plenary session of the Central Committee is to modernize uh, state governance system and state governance capability. Even though uh, the conclusion they have arrived at is neither here nor there, because uh, the conclusion is they must buttress the power of the party. And uh, the party does not have a glorious track record in uh, modernizing uh, institutions of uh, uh, administration. Uh, however, it shows that at least for somebody who is so confident as Xi Jinping, he sees, well, uh, he sees the writing on the wall, the fact that if the, if the party state that doesn't reform itself, then it could be all the way downhill. At least uh, there might be a problem uh, tackling the economy, coupled with the uh, exacerbated contradictions with the US. Well, as for the profession of China watching, um, despite the close and very tight self-censorship, uh, I have been able to talk to a fairly uh, large and representative variety of uh, civil service, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, civil society representatives. Uh, you might not realize the fact that um, there are, for example, hundreds of uh, Christians, uh, hundreds of members of the, well, well, these are officials of the members of the underground church actually studying in Hong Kong, actually studying in Hong Kong. And despite the fact that in 2017, uh, the party state passed a draconian, very strict law on foreign NGO, uh, which empowers the police to uh, undertake very tight surveillance on the activities of foreign NGOs in China. Uh, the communication between Hong Kong-based NGOs and uh, those in the mainland has continued largely uh, unaffected, of course the Hong Kong-based and foreign-based NGOs have, been, have to be more careful, but they do interact with uh, domestic uh, China-based NGOs, and they do get good information as to 
which way the, the, the wind is blowing out of the Zhongnan High Party headquarters. So I think despite the uh, apparent dominance of, uh, dominance of um, state censorship, a lot of information is still flowing around. It's still flowing around. And even though uh, they have closed down the blocks and um, individual communication uh, channels of so-called big Vs or opinion leaders, we still hear uh, opinions and voices from intellectuals, from labor activists, uh, from other members of the civil society. So uh, China watching can never be a exact science, but uh, <laughs> uh, we still have enough um, material to uh, put together a reasonably uh, credible scenario as to what might happen in the medium to long term. Thank you very much. Uh, this lady, yes. Your your affiliation first. Uh, I'm year one student from Faculty of Social Science, and my name is Evelyn Choi. Um, I would like to ask for the prediction for China's future, because um, under which cases that China will encounter a transformation in their politics. Um, it is the it is under Xi Jinping's surveillance repressive measures that urge the people to stand against the communist government, or it is um, after a long ruling of the uh, President Xi's, because like in history, many long ruling leaders, after their um, finished terms of office, there will be a political vacuum. So the political vacuum will um, urge the people to stand against for the government. At, at that time, there will be a transformation. Or like Stalin changing from Khrushchev, because like Stalin is a uh, socialist leader, and Khrushchev is a more revisionist leader. So. Um, which case do, um, would you prefer that it is for China's future? It is under and in terms of President Xi, it is the political vacuum or it is the transformation leader that can bring the China's future a transformation. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a very, uh, very good and well thought out question. Well, uh, for Xi Jinping himself, um, his preference is that uh, he be allowed to remain the Mao Zedong of the 21st century until, uh, what I said, until 232, 233, until he's 70, at least he's 79 or, or uh, 80 years old. However, uh, things do not happen in a vacuum. So um, we see Xi Jinping's group um, having problems handling uh, two or three major questions. Uh, the, the first being the economy, okay? The first being the economy. The uh, Chinese economic miracle ended almost as soon as Xi Jinping became general secretary in 2012. And so far, uh, they have not been able to find new uh, ways of growing the economy, for example, High tech, uh, the uh, Made in China 2025 program, which was uh, un unveiled by um, <coughs> unveiled by uh, Premier Li Keqiang, has met with uh, resistance from the U.S. And secondly, uh, consumer spending has been hurt because uh, most of the uh, middle class households have borrowed so much money paying for the mortgage to the extent that uh, middle class household loans account for some 52% of GDP. So this is one problem which uh, has been disturbing Xi Jinping for, for the past several years and for which answers are lacking at the moment. Uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the remaining and most effective pillar of legitimacy of the party is natural, uh, nationalism. Well, uh, in order to justify his uh, perhaps inordinately ambitious program, uh, personal uh, agenda of staying in power until 2033, Xi Jinping has told his 
intimate uh, followers that he needs to hang on, not because he is personally ambitious, but because he needs he wants to solve the Taiwan problem within his lifetime. That is before he's 80 years old, and China needs somebody who is experienced enough with the PLA, experienced enough with international affairs to solve the Taiwan problem. So, uh, if the economy continues to worsen, if uh, problems with the U.S. continue to be uh, exacerbated, there's a possibility that Xi Jinping might jump the gun on Taiwan. And uh, if a, either a short-term military expedition or other means fail, then Xi Jinping, who everybody refers to as the chairman of everything, he cannot make a scapegoat of any of his uh, generals or his colleagues. He has to take the rap. He has to uh, resign to take responsibility. So uh, there are many possibilities for changes, many possibilities for unexpected events. And uh, as I mentioned, Xi Jinping himself surprised me uh, when he mentioned the possibility of a black swan event happen, happening in China this year. So uh, we should not be too pessimistic about the fact that uh, given the supposed viability of the police state system, that there would be no change within uh, the nation holding 1.4 billion people. Thank you. Yes, this gentleman in the red shirt Yes, yes. Uh, hello, I'm Andy Chen from, I'm a ERQ student studying economics and finance. Uh, uh, in your, in your uh, you mentioned nationalism. Uh, I know that we all know that in the Western country, uh, nationalism is always considered as a bad thing. Some, some view, uh, some may view that uh, it is national, nationalism that uh, results in the World War II. But in, but in China, it seems that Nationalism is always mixed with patriotism, uh, or it is not a, such a bad thing. So I wonder uh, how, how will you comment on Chinese government's strategy of, of the nationalism to, the, to those global issues, such as the, uh, maybe the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong, uh, the things happening in Hong Kong now? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a, a good um, will point. Well, um, I mentioned at the outset that there is a, at least a, a new Cold War uh, starting between China and the U.S. And one of the reasons is Xi Jinping's uh, overweening, overarching ambition to project Chinese hard and soft power. So uh, in terms of uh, trade, uh, at least from the U.S. point of view, Beijing seems to be bending the rules. Beijing seems to be not following the market reforms as laid down by Deng Xiaoping. And then there are geopolitical contention. Uh, it has long been a principle of Chinese foreign policy not to construct overseas naval and air bases. But several bases have been constructed in uh, islands whose sovereignty is disputed between China and a host of Southeast Asian countries, uh, not to mention uh, China's building a military port in Gwadar in western Pakistan, and China's um, naval and air force base in Djibouti, which is a small country but strategically located country in northeastern uh, Africa. So. And the entire Belt and Road Initiative, uh, according to a number of reputed uh, Chinese economists, comes to a case of strategic overdraft, strategic overdraft. Because even in its initial stage, uh, one trillion US dollars worth of investments are needed. And uh, we have seen in the past year that uh, China, which is bankrolling about 
80% of the uh, infrastructure projects uh, is running out of money. Uh, or from an, another perspective, 80% of the infrastructure projects along the Belt and Road Initiative are actually handled by SOE, state-owned enterprise conglomerates. And many of these state-owned enterprise conglomerates, while catching headlines, international headlines, in financial newspapers around the world, they're heavily in debt. For example, the China High Speed Railway Corporation is running a debt of 4.7 trillion RMB. So, uh, so it comes as no surprise that even though you are not allowed to criticize Xi Jinping openly in the Chinese media, uh, there are China watchers, there are analysts, both ethnic Chinese and overseas around the world who think that Xi Jinping has pushed too far his uh, overweening ambition to uh, become the equal of the U.S. in 2049. That means the centenary of the establishment of the PRC is overly ambitious and it has led to what a famous uh, political scientist called a strategic overdraft. That means the Chinese economy does not have what it takes to support such uh, an expansionist, overly ambitious power projection around the world. I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Yes, from the back row. My question is a little bit more on your presentation rather than an extent. Um, so if we think the civil society discourse and rhetoric are one extreme in China, because most people even don't talk about that, and the official language, another extreme discourse narrative. And so given that most people even don't talk about civil society, I, I truly believe that your, your stories, your evidence back the civil society uh, analysis, but given that most people in China, I mean ordinary people, migrant workers, so many other issues worry about. So what's the vanity or, 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 or validity to use civil society as an angle to analyze China's problem uh, and China's uh, uh, future direction? That's my concern because I'm an anthropologist. Uh, I work in, in architecture faculty. But that's always my concern, right? So this is such a good perspective and such a good framework. But given that most people in China don't care about it, I mean, most people, maybe 90%, 80%, I'm not sure. Right? So how, how we can use this framework to analyze China? Yeah, thank you. It is a, it's a capital question. Um, well, first of all, as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> It was only during the Hu Jintao era, that means from 202 to 2012, that the state somewhat grudgingly admitted the existence of uh, the civil society and also admitted the contributions made by NGOs. Uh, I remember not too long ago when, she, when, when uh, uh, Hu Jintao was running the show, uh, Hu Jintao actually uh, ordered the state councils to farm out some of the uh, environmental projects, some of the labor-related projects, for example, uh, collective bargaining, education, and so forth, and also uh, issues dealing with the uh, peasants and uh, migrant workers in the cities. Uh, this work Hu Jintao realized that could not be done efficiently by civil servants, so uh, such work was farmed out to NGO organizations, even though this was not broadcast uh, very clearly in the uh, official media. Well, uh, it is true that if you read uh, only the People's Daily, uh, Xinhua News Agency, uh, Global Times and so forth, <clears throat> you very seldom come across mention of the civil of, of the civil society or the uh, 
useful functions performed by civil societies. However, uh, this is an operation uh, deliberately. Uh, deli this is an aberration of idea deliberately fostered by the leadership. Uh, as I mentioned, for Xi Jinping, he wants the party to occupy the entire universe of discourse. That means he wants Chinese to think only about serving the party and only about serving society through the party. He doesn't want people to be reminded that apart from the party state military apparatus, that is also the civil service where people can contribute, uh, can, can volunteer their service, can uh, donate money and so forth. But this is just a long process. And I think the fact that the, uh, again, taking the underground church as an example, the fact that the underground church since the end of the Cultural Revolution has been spreading very fast demonstrates the fact that for most Chinese there is a, there is a spiritual vacuum and they think that the spiritual vacuum cannot be filled by the brand of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought and now Xi Jinping thought being propagated by the uh, state propaganda. So uh, it is just it is just a human nature, I think, a, a fact of human nature that people desire freedom of uh, thought, freedom of expression, and for the Xi Jinping administration, despite the ferocity and viability of his police state apparatus, to subsume everything, subsume people's thoughts, subsume people's actions under the party, uh, this could be this could prove to be self-defeating at, at the end. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. I think it's very important. I just have two more questions. Uh, you, uh, you mentioned about one of the watch points is uh, regarding the NGO, uh, uh, potentially you know, the, uh, the reactions in, in China that could be one of the watch points happening to, to sort of react I just want to uh, hear from you what 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 makes you think that NGOs in China is is actually uh, ever able to make that impact, uh, given the fact that if you see what's happening in Hong Kong for the past five months, um, none of the uh, domestic or international large NGO dare to say anything at all. Uh, if you see the, you know, the underage uh, children who are arrested. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for a very thoughtful a question. question. <laughs> may, may, maybe I'll tackle your first question first. <laughs> well, um, in watching China, sometimes we look at China from the front, but also from the back and sideways. I think um, Xi Jinping, seeing what has happened in Hong Kong since uh, early June, uh, is really afraid that the Hong Kong virus might affect the mainland. So that's why lopsidedly and without any um, exception, the state media has focused on the negative aspects, on the negative aspects of the uh, protest actions or other actions uh, perpetrated by Hong Kong NGOs. So this is to uh, ensure that most ordinary Chinese will have a negative view of first the actions and thoughts of Hong Kong NGOs and secondly the actions and propensities and um, possible uh, actions and um, other thoughts and directions of the civil society in general. So they have been very successful. Uh, I come across uh, 
Chinese students from different parts of the PRC on a regular basis on campus. And most of them, I think, have been convinced by Beijing's um, propaganda that the NGOs in Hong Kong are up to no good. The NGOs might be um, idealistic, but the end result is uh, more destructive than constructive. Sorry, your second question. Second question, did you mention about the, you know, the, the symptoms of decay, sort of weakness that you have under your observation in China? And I, I, my, my, my take is a lot of them is actually uh, very uh, 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 locally sort of driven. Can you comment a little bit about from the external forces, but in particular, what, what do you think the US can impact in, in, in terms of driving sort of any changes in, uh, in, in, in China going forward? Well, thank you. Well, the question of um, not just corruption, but the relation of duty and also failure of the, um, both the party and state and military apparatus to uh, respond to uh, difficult issues in society uh, has been well known, has been well known. So I gave you many examples. For example, the fact that um, the state has not been able to handle the business of the demobilized soldiers for seven, eight years, despite the fact that, as, as Mao Zedong said, you know, power grows out of the barrel of the gun. The, one of the uh, basis of Chinese rule is its tight control over the military. So such problems as corruption um, does not manifest itself only, in, only at the local levels. Uh, in the first few years of Xi Jinping's rule, he was uh, very adamant about tackling the so-called big tigers. And Zhou Yongkang the, was the only former Politburo Standing Company member to have been detained by police. However, uh, in the past, in the recent two or three years, we have seen a slackening of the pace of the anti-corruption campaign. And corruption is mostly seen cynically and I think correct, correctly as a potent political weapon whereby the Xi Jinping faction uses to bring down uh, their opponents. So corruption is not so much, anti-corruption is not so much done to improve uh, social morality, social ethics as a potent weapon to wipe out Xi Jinping's personal enemies. So I think uh, the party state needs to do a lot more to, to convince the people that it's really a model for serving the people as first preached by uh, Chairman Mao Zedong. Thank you very much. Yes. Um. I'm curious to hear more about um, the underground church body, uh, the underground community of Christians in China, because you, uh, in your talk, you mentioned that the, the number is huge and growing, and that they are very much part of this you know, civil society that we are not necessarily aware of outside of China. But as we know very well from China, from Hong Kong, um, churches are not necessarily anti-Beijing. So how, what, what, what are the evidence that we've seen in China that may suggest that this could be, the underground church may be a huge destabilizing force against Xi Jinping's ambition? Right, thank you. Well, uh, from my study of, um, underground churches in different parts of China, I realized that there is a uh, controversy going on. Uh, quite a number of uh, underground Christian leaders mm -hmm. think that they should cooperate with the government. And in fact, they have joined in patriotic movements such as uh, holding ex expeditions uh, with a communist flag 
But at the same time, uh, there are holdouts in different parts of China, uh, consisting of underground church leaders who think that they should insist, they should insist on the primacy of uh, the church. That means the church should not yield its initiative, should not yield its um, uh, <clears throat> beliefs, just to win the toleration of the Communist Party. And I think uh, from 204, 2014 onwards, the harsh treatment of the churches, the tearing down of the crosses, uh, has betrayed the, the party state leaders' fear that somehow, because of the spiritual vacuum amongst the people, the church might provide the answer. So I think the, um, the battle is still un un unsettled. The, the battle still goes on as to whether uh, some church groups should consider the more strategic way of uh, reconciliating with the powers that be for the short term versus those who are much more adamant about sticking to their beliefs and not yielding an inch to the encroachment uh, of the party state apparatus. But uh, I, I have to uh, assure you that most of the uh, reporting out of China shows that the police seem to be having an upper hand over the church. That means, uh, for example, we know that uh, most underground churches uh, they are under 24-hour police surveillance. But uh, what is not known is that actually many of these police, police people, uh, as well as the local cadres, res responsibility for uh, ensuring the safety of the churches, uh, they are themselves converts. <laughs> they are themselves converts. So sometimes it's difficult to... Um, get at the reality from superficial phenomenon. I think uh, we are approaching the end. So may I take just one more sure, question? question? Yeah, 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 please. Uh, I'm curious what you think about the overseas Chinese, in particular the overseas Chinese students. Uh, as you probably would agree that they have play some role in China's development in modern you know, eras. What do you think? In the future for the of development in China? Well, particularly from the point of civil service groups, I think uh, they take a lot of uh, support, uh, a lot of spiritual solace uh, from the fact that they have received support from uh, ethnic Chinese in different parts of the world, despite the fact that uh, Chinese embassies and consulates in different countries, they have, they have put immense pressure on such ethnic Chinese groups not to provide either financial or spiritual aid to uh, civil service groups within China. But I think the um, financial, spiritual, and other kinds of support provided by overseas Chinese groups are pivotal to keeping up the spirit amongst the civil service groups now that they are undergoing a long, bitter winter. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.